Back here at home to the United Airlines passenger jet and the alarming images from inside the cockpit, the windshield shattering, the pilot cut and bleeding, making an emergency landing. Just a couple of days ago, United 1093 at 37,000 feet got hit by something. And there's been wild speculation all over the place about what that something might have been. The news ran wild with a space debris story about space, just come, stuff coming out of space and it didn't burn up in the atmosphere and it just happened to hit uh, United 1093. And I'm here to tell you uh, that I ran the numbers on that happening and it's a trillion to one. Okay. Uh, and the likelihood of it happening anytime in the next 30,000 years falls into that category of a trillion to one. So space debris hitting an airplane, pretty rare. And it's not completely zero. I got that. But it's not what happened. Other people thought, well, maybe it was hail. Maybe it was a lightning strike. Maybe it was a bird at 37,000 feet. It was none of the above. The story is now out. and We've got the news right here. John Dean, the CEO of a company called uh, Windborne, all right, says it was his fault and it was one of his weather balloons. <laughs> All right, let me read the story to you. John Dean, not that John Dean from uh, Watergate fame, but this John Dean, CEO of Windborne, believes his weather balloon was responsible for the incident involving the United 737, excuse me, 36,000 feet. Uh, yes, I think this was a Windborne balloon, he says. Uh, we learned about United Airlines 1093 and the potential that it was related to one of our balloons at 11 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday and immediately looked into it. At 6 a.m. Pacific time, we sent our preliminary investigation to both NTSB, the FAA, and we are working with both of them to investigate further. There's a little bit of evidence here uh, that this was a weather balloon. And, and back in the day, right, everything got, got blamed on weather balloons. If it was a uh, UFO, they got, it was always a weather balloon. And everybody was kind of skeptical about that. And a lot of people for a lot of years didn't believe that weather balloons even existed. Um, this weather balloon and let me bring up some data about this particular weather balloon because it's actually kind of fascinating um, how these things operate. But there are weather balloons and they fly up in the atmosphere and they're not controlled by anything. They're just around. I've never even seen one. I'm not sure I would see one. An airplane moves so quickly that just like this accident, it would catch you completely by surprise. There's no way you could maneuver out of the way of a small object like that. You would just hit it because you're moving so fast. But he writes here in this uh, story that says 2019, Windborne has been launching weather balloons that stay aloft for an average of seven days, all right, collecting vital atmospheric data and sharing it with NOAA. All right, so here's some data on weather balloons, and they do actually exist, my friends, um, but there are some misconceptions about them. Here's the number one thing that with how they do. They launch, uh, and they stay airborne, like he said, for about seven days days altogether. They collect temperature, humidity, humidity, barometric pressure, wind speed, and direction. And then, of course, our weather services um, can use all of that. Um, the key components here are the balloon. Uh, it's made of natural latex and neoprene. Uh, it inflates with high hydrogen and helium, it says. Uh, starts at about 1.5 to 2 meters, so that's 5 to 6 feet in diameter. It expands all the way to six to eight meters or 20 to 25 feet. Uh, and, and at times it can go as high as 100,000 feet. Now there were some clues here from the pictures of the damage that could have indicated that it was actually a weather balloon. I don't think anybody was clever enough to see all this, but now that you know it was a weather balloon and what's included, more importantly, in a weather balloon. I'll tell you that in a minute. Now you can see it clearly on the photo. A lot of folks thought this might be lightning or might be hail. Of course, they were not anywhere near any sort of convective activity and you probably wouldn't be at 36,000 feet. Hail damage looks a whole lot different than this. It would be all over the airplane, not just one windshield. Lightning would have left a, a scorch mark uh, somewhere where it hit. There would have been like a black ring of, of singeing around it. None of that is there. So let me show you the, the picture of the weather 
balloon, not the whole balloon, but the active part, the part that sends back all that information back to Earth, all right? It is just a little transmitter thing in a kind of a plastic-ish bag, but in that bag, and here's the key to the whole thing, are you ready for this, is sand. They use the sand as ballast, all right, for the weather balloon to keep it not from, I guess, I don't know, going into outer space or something, but they use it as, as ballast, all right? Now, let's take a look at the picture of the damage on that United jet. Because as you look at it, the imprint of that bag that we just looked at, look at the imprint on that picture. It looks like it kind of hit, it was dangling down like that, and it hit the upper right-hand section of that windshield as we look at it. And then also left an imprint on the metal and curled up some of the metal just above the windscreen. But look at the windscreen itself. And this was a little clue that yeah, we all missed, right? But it looks like the windshield has been sandblasted, doesn't it? Take a closer look at it. So we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. After 34 years in the airlines, I finally hung up the wings. No more pre-flights, no more weather briefings, just peace and quiet. But some habits, they don't retire that easily. Every morning, my internal clock still hits 4.30 sharp. And before I know it, I'm doing one last pre-flight check right here at the sink. This is the Henson Shaving Razor, precision machine from aerospace-grade aluminum. Tolerance is so tight, they'd pass any FAA inspection. It delivers a shave so smooth, it's basically turbulence-free. No plastic, no gimmicks, no subscriptions, just clean engineering and lifetime reliability the kind of craftsmanship pilots appreciate, even after the final landing. Old habits die hard, but at least now, the only runway I'm clearing is my jawline. So whether you're logging hours or logging off for good, make every morning a smooth takeoff. Head to hensonshaving.com Steve and use code Steve to get 100 free blades with your razor because great pilots and great shaves never lose their edge. And thanks to Henson for sponsoring today's video. Sponsors like this help us to make more content for you. It looks like it's been sandblasted. And in fact, it has. It, it ran into that thing at about 550 miles an hour. And that sand just left an imprint on not only the metal, but especially on the glass. And so when hail hits it, it kind of cracks and breaks. And you can tell the little round marks from the, from the hail. But this is little tiny... Uh, just like a, it's like hazed glass now or smoked glass. And it's because it hit that bag with all the sand in it. And so the CEO of uh, Windborne said that he's working with the FAA and the NTSB um, to, uh, to, to try to get to the bottom of it. But the bottom line is these things are floating around and they're not controlled. Uh, and so the likelihood of running into one of these, yeah, it's probably pretty remote. It's probably a million to one or more, but it's not a trillion to one or more, like hitting space debris. So my friends, if you were concerned that somehow you're gonna get on an airliner and you were gonna hit something falling from outer space, really, in the next 30,000 years, that's gonna happen once. Uh, I, I wouldn't spend a lot of time losing any sleep over that one. Uh, are you concerned about weather balloons? Well, this is the first time in my lifetime I've heard of an airliner hitting a weather balloon. So maybe it's a once in a hundred year sort of thing. I don't know. Uh, that's a whole lot less than one in every 30,000 years, but it's still nothing to lose any sleep over. Uh, and the damage it caused was significant. You saw the picture of the, the captain's arm, and we were wondering why was the captain injured and not the first officer? Because the first officer sits on the right side of the cockpit and the captain sits on the left. Well, first of all, I don't know that the first officer wasn't injured. There's just no pictures of him or her. Uh, the captain's arm, you can see that, that kind of you know bloody arm over there, but the windshield that's on the right side of the cockpit as I'm sitting in the left seat faces me. The other one in front of me faces my first officer. So if that thing were to let go and explode, that the glass fragments would come my way right, right off that windshield and probably bypass 
my first officer. There are three structural layers to that glass windshield, right? This obviously hit the outside layer, but it hit it with such force and such impact. And now you can see it's a pretty big object. It's probably about this big altogether. It's metal, so it's going to cause a lot of damage. It broke all three layers of the protective uh, d the windshield. Uh, not They didn't give way, but they did fracture. And so enough glass fragments came off that it uh, injured the uh, captain. And you can imagine how startled they were in the cockpit, but we actually train for these sort of things. So it's called the startle effect. And if anything startles you, for instance, an engine fire light comes on or a windshield cracks unexpectedly and glass is flying everywhere, or there would be, let's say, an explosive depressurization in the airplane, maybe a window in the back let loose and all the depressurization, go depressurization goes out at once in the aircraft, we're to break the startle effect by the pilot at the controls saying, my aircraft. And that starts the sequence of events of everybody going into their role and what they do. So let's say I'm flying. I would say to my co-pilot, my aircraft. The co-pilot then would go and open up the manuals, look for a checklist, right? An appropriate checklist. And then the two of us would begin to work that checklist together. One of the things they had to do in this incident was they had to descend rather quickly to 10,000 feet. So let me show you a picture of the checklist uh, that we use. In this checklist, right about two thirds of the way down says descend to 10,000 feet. Why? Well, if you've, if you've fractured or put in jeopardy all three of those structural layers of the windshield, it's very likely that one of them or all three of them are gonna give way completely and you're gonna lose pressurization inside the airplane. So in order to breathe and not have the rubber jungle, all the masks drop in the back, you're going to descend rather rapidly down to 10,000 feet. We call it an emergency descent. It's not really all that big of an emergency, but we do want to get to it in a timely manner. So, you know, you hit flight level change, you dial in 10,000 feet, you grab the boards and pull them out, pull the engines to throttle, and you start down as quickly as you can while you're declaring a mayday, mayday, mayday on the radio. I'm sure that these United pilots handled that brilliantly uh, as they diverted into Salt Lake. They were on their way from Denver to LA, I think. They diverted into Salt Lake. Lots going on in those first few seconds after something hits your windshield and first of all and foremost is to make sure that nobody's hurt they can still you know they didn't get any glass in your eyes then make sure that your aircraft is still intact and it's still flying well they did all of those things they worked the checklist they communicated with everybody on the outside and then we have to tie a ribbon on it and go what in the world happened well now we know what happened it was a weather balloon all right by windborne company and the ceo john dean uh, told us what happened, and uh, and he's working with the NTSB and the FAA to get to the bottom of it. But now you know. I'm Captain Steve. Fly safe. We've covered a lot of things going wrong in a jet. If you want to see some, take a look at one of these two videos.